as you know, I bet a lot during the season. I build a lot of positions on these and I have a lot of different ways I like to bet because I prefer team betting. MVP is the, is the thing I pay the most attention to during the season. However, I, from a betting standpoint, I think there's actually a lot of value in years where there's not a predominant favorite like this one. I think there's a lot of value and historically that kind of has been the case. If we look back, you know, sports odds history has all these uh, reviews of of recent years. And one thing I did find when we look at the actual title odds is, so you've got these years where the Warriors were the favorite and they won, and the Heat with LeBron were the favorite and they won. And you've got this the, when the Lakers were the favorites and they won. But other than that, if it's not a year where you have this one team that's ultra dominant, there is a little bit of separation. Last year's winner was the sixth highest in champion odds ranks preseason. The year before was second. The year before was fourth. You know, we had those two years with the Warriors. Then the Cavs were actually third prior in, in the year that they won. Um, going back to before the, the heat run, you've got the Mavericks, which were seventh. And the Lakers were actually only second. You have these little opportunities. This is historically... I will say one of the people things that people talk about when we we talk about betting NBA and especially title futures is we will talk about how there's kind of these there's always been these favorites these big big favorites we're not in that era right now we're just not in an era of big favorites. Yeah, I was going to ask you that we'll probably get into it, but it does it feels like you know we've been used to for for a decade really of having the you know we had four years of heat and we had five years of warriors. We basically had an entire decade of just, well, we know how this goes. And you know me, you know me and uh, my fatalism of how I kind of latch on to like, all right, well, we all know how this is going to end. Here's the team that's the title favorites, the slow death march toward the finish line. I think that as fans, we've kind of been, we, we've kind of been told, not really told, but we, we, we are trained to think that way. That's what's been happening a lot of times. That doesn't always end that way because the injury comes at the wrong time or that sort of thing. But we're on like a decade in a row of, of that, of, of that priming us for the season, but it's ended. And it's a very different thing these last few years. And for a while, I think we kind of did like, well, you know, the Warriors got hurt. Well, the pandemic and the bubble. Well, you know, we, we kind of started making excuses for why there wasn't that team. And yeah, I'm wondering what you think now. Do you think, is this just a new era and we just need to reprime how we think about this and we don't have that dominant team and we probably won't going forward until something changes, you know, in the CBA or, or how the cap rule works? Part of what I think here is, I, I will say this, it was baffling to me. I bet the Warriors plus 1200 the day after the 2021 finals. Um, I bet them consistently in preseason. Like that was a big position for us. Now I, I took a hit on that when I faded them in the finals versus the Celtics. You're welcome. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, but, but in general, I made out very well on this, on the Warriors winning. And, and in truth, I really kind of still feel like if there, if you want to go a contrarian to the idea of parody, that's the answer here is like, no. look, when the Warriors have been healthy, they've won the title when the warriors have been healthy they've won the west and then you could argue like they lost andrew bogut in 2016 and then draymond misses a game like if they have their guys for the duration of the series they win the title and that's been true since 2015 when steve kerr arrived like they took two years off and recouped and got healthy and rebuilt the roster and now you can argue that they're back i think there's probably some value on the Warriors now. Um, I don't know if I want to bet them right now because I do think they're going to have a rough regular season. We'll talk about that when we get to their win total. So they're a team that I do. We we talked about you and, and I and Raheem are always our former colleague now at the ringer, uh, Raheem Palmer, um, who now gets paid to podcast like once a week. Like we uh, we're always talking about. OK, how do we define like how do we define value and why do we think this is going to be a better number later? We we're talking about this with Joe on Twitter too. Like we don't do enough of specifically. I think this team is going to be better at X point with the warriors. I genuinely think on like January 1st is going to be a really good low buying low point for a warrior's title future. Um, 
and we could talk a little bit about kind of the timing of some of this stuff. I do want to start here because this is a conference and title odds feature. And I honestly don't have a good question, a good answer for this, Brandon. When is there value in betting a conference title odds versus the NBA championship? So I think the answer to that depends a lot on how do you see the overall landscape? And that won't surprise you because you know that that's my thing. That's what I do is I try to zoom out and do the big picture landscape. But I think especially, you know, we talked about this during the playoffs that just, just finished a few months ago that we kept looking at, okay, well, what's the finals look like? You love your finals matchups and you love to kind of think about, well, what about this team and how do they match up against whoever right now, this didn't happen this way, but during the playoffs, there was a prevailing thought. I think we both shared it that we like the East. We didn't really necessarily know if we believed in the Warriors. We had a lot of doubts about the Suns. We had questions about some of the other West teams. There was a West gauntlet. So there was a better chance of not the best team coming out of the West. Whereas in the East, you had Giannis, you had Embiid, perhaps you had the Celtics who were the juggernaut. It felt like the East was the champion and the West would maybe be the consolation prize. It didn't turn out that way, but to me, that's where I remember during our playoff run looking to bet. I did bet on the Warriors. I only bet them to win the West, though. I wish I'd bet them for title, but I bet them under that premise where I think that you can win a few series. I think that the Warriors could beat the Suns or the Mavericks or the Jazz. Those were their possible conference finals opponents. But I didn't like the matchup. I didn't like, you know, what happens when you get to, especially right now, we still have, we have Giannis and we have Embiid, these dominant big men that a team like the Warriors, we still don't know what would they have done against a team like that, against a, a specific matchup like that. So I think if you look at the conferences like that, and it could be the opposite, maybe you think that the Embiid, Giannis, Celtics types teams have been slugging it out all year and they can't keep up with the fast, better, the West is just better at everything. Maybe you think that, but I think that's your spot to say, okay, I'm going to bet on the team to just win the conference. I don't want to have to take on the extra matchup in the finals. I don't know if I like the matchup for them in the finals where it goes. Then I think that's a spot where you can bet conference instead. That's, that's the main way for me. I've got a couple other things, but what do you think about that? I think you make some the good points about, the matchups i will say that i don't bet a lot of conference stuff hmm. uh i'll bet conference matchups i have a bunch of already conference finalists matchups because DraftKings put that out there and so i went bonkers doing parlays on it <laughs> um because i'm a sicko but the reason i would say this is if you're gonna bet a conference future I think that you need to be focused on, like you said, the matchups. And for that, you need to see the regular season and you need to see the actual bracket. Yes. You need to be able to see X, Y, Z. You need to be able to see like, they're going to play this team and this team. They're not going to have to play this team. Um, as an example, right? If the Suns have to face the Clippers this year, based off of what I know right now, let's say they started tomorrow. Okay. Then I wouldn't want to bet sun's conference futures. I would just want to bet sun's title futures. Cause it's like, look, if I think they can beat the, the Clippers, I think they can win the whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I think you need to do when you're doing conference and title odds is you have to decide up front. Are you like, are you a hedger or not? Because you're going to have so long, between now and even if you bet like January, that's a six month wait on that. So you need to decide like, are you somebody that wants to hedge or, or do you want to just bet it and forget about it? If you're looking to do that, you know, I think you can bet mid season and get good value and just go in on the team that you're like, they're just the best, right? Like I bet the Warriors when, when Draymond got hurt and I didn't think it was going to be a big deal. And I was lucky that it turned out that way. Like, I bet the Warriors again. And when Steph got hurt and everyone's like, ooh, and I was like, it's a minor ankle sprain, they're fine. I bet the Warriors again. Um, timing, I think, is really crucial in these markets. 
I think even more so than MVP because those awards can take twists and turns based off of individual performance and injuries rather than these title features, which are very much built on, like, do you have the capacity to get through the gauntlet of the playoffs? And a lot of that's injury, but a lot of it's also like matchup stuff. And we talked throughout the year a lot on, the, on buckets about what teams were built for postseason versus regular season. And then Brandon ignores all that and that's on the jazz. But in general, like we talk a lot about which teams are built for, for which and which teams we have a lot of confidence in and which teams we don't. And so those are opportunities that I think, again, to kind of look for it. Um, for you, what's an identifier for finding value either in preseason? Let's talk about preseason first. Yeah. What are, is it just team strength? Is it depth for them to survive injuries? Like how do you find value on a conference or a title bet at this point in the season? So I want to separate those because, well, well, let me respond first to what you said, then I'll answer the question. I, I think what you said kind of mirrors what I said in this way. If you're betting a title future, you are just going all in on that team to be the best, period. They will take on all comers, whoever they get, they'll beat them. That's what you're betting on for a title future. For a conference, you can not quite have to do that. You can kind of envision the path and say, well, I don't know if I'm quite ready, like for me, to believe that the Warriors were ready to take on everyone and beat them. I did not believe that when the playoffs started. I did think they were very good, good enough to navigate the path to come out of the West. And so that was a spot for it. So I think conference is more of a matchup and path sort of angle. Title odds is more of this is my team. This is my guys. I'm going in. I believe in them. I don't care who they have to face. I like them. I'll like them in any matchup. Let's go. So that said, how I identify who I would bet on for a conference future right now in August, before the season starts in particular, the teams that catch my eye when I'm looking down through the list right now are the teams that I think that I expect to be very good regular season teams. And it's not necessarily, now that's going to be our jazz again, not this year, not anymore. But a year or two years ago right now, that's me saying, you know what? Let's bet on the Jazz right now. And that would not have worked out for me if I only played the Jazz. But as I think about conference and title futures, this may surprise you. Normally have been more of a grab my team and ride them out. No hedging, no, no building on it. That's my guys. As I think about conference and title, especially now, so far away, 10 months away from it paying out, if I'm going to play a ticket now, to me, it has to be because I'm building a position. And I don't like to think of it necessarily as hedging. Hedging can have a negative connotation of like, oh, I'm going to sacrifice my value. I'm in a good spot, but I'll just take what I can and get out. I don't think building a position has to be that. And you've helped me learn that, that you can grab this team, grab that team, get the price while it's low. It, it's a portfolio. It's a stock market. You're buying when, when the price is low and being able to grab it later. So I look at a team like a Denver or like a Minnesota. Those are teams that caught my eye. I was like, I think that you have a chance to be a very, very good regular season team. Why is that valuable? Because I expect you to outperform what your current win total looks like. And more importantly, I expect you to maybe be the one seed, the two seed. And now you have a much better path when the playoffs start than what the odds are currently implying right now. The odds are currently assuming the Clippers, the Warriors, the Suns, maybe the Lakers are the top seed. If I think Denver is the one seed, and that implies now I get home court for all the Western series, and now I get a favorable matchup once, maybe twice, then buying a Denver ticket right now has value, even if I don't necessarily think Denver can finish the job later. The question of building a position, I think, is it just depends on how much you want to bet during the season, right? Like a lot, that's gonna be the starting point. It's like if you don't, if you have a full time job and you like to listen to this podcast on the side, but you're not gonna, you know, you don't want to be betting, whatever. Then, like consistently, you just want to have a bet and ride it. Then you know we'll have those picks for you. I do think that the way that I tend to look at it, though is there is, I mean, part of this is it's always I think about things so much from the viewpoint of probability i don't look at it from a i'm not a takesman right like i don't look at this and go like the 
the Clippers are absolutely winning the NBA. T- like, I don't, I don't know, man. Like there's a, I, I understand how fragile these things are. I've seen great teams not win the title. I've seen teams that should have won the title. The 2019 Milwaukee Bucks, Raheem, should have won the title. They didn't. Sometimes Fred Van Vliet has a kid and shoots 75% effective field goal percentage for five games. It happens. Like, this stuff just happens in the NBA. Um, and that's one of the things I do think is interesting. This question of buying the dip versus making sure that you're not missing an opportunity when one team is asserting itself. This season was actually a really fascinating um, example of this, where I regret not being more bullish on the Celtics early. Like, I bet enough of the Celtics in the early rounds, and then I bet them when they went down to the Bucks. You know, I took opposite tracks on that Bucks Celtics series. When the Celtics went down, I was like, I'm buying Celtics now. They don't have Chris Middleton. They're still in the series, yada, yada. I had, you know, standing bets of uh, Celtics Warriors from early from the first round. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I like this parlay so much later. Um, but like, those are the things that helped me. If you look back though, like if we go back and we look at where these bets were mid season and what the value was, like I was really stunned when I went back and looked at some of these, at these numbers that were on the board as I was prepping for this podcast you know, the Celtics uh, in 2020, okay, on January 1st, the Celtics were plus 2,000. The Heat were plus 3,500. The Heat, maybe you could say that that was like a weird example because of the bubble and everything, but the Celtics we knew were really good. And they were 20 to 1 to win the title. If you look back this year, even, um, there really was kind of a, a delayed effect in terms of when the odds caught up on the Celtics. Uh, as of January 1st, the Boston Celtics were plus 6,600. February 1st, a month later, that's when they, they started late, right? Was when the run started, 6,600. By All-Star, they're down to 2,500, but they're still 25 to 1. March 1st, they're 18 to 1. And on April 1st, two weeks before the playoffs, the Celtics are still plus 900. When we had, as you would constantly talk about, this multi-month run, where they were the best team in basketball. And we're still getting a nine to one on them as of April 1st over at BetMGM. Right? Yeah, well, and I think part of that is that as good as they had been, it, it's part that, well, is it real? Will it last? Like, you know, you said as much as anyone on the podcast, like, I don't want to buy it at their high point. I, yeah. I feel like it's going to cool off. So that is part of it. And I think the books have to kind of price that in. But the other thing is, that early dip does matter because that early dip meant that no matter how good the Celtics were, they still were not going to be the one seed. And that meant this year that they still were going to have to face the Bucks in the second round. That mattered. And that's part of what was priced into those odds because hot team or not, the Celtics had what looked like a really difficult path and turned out to be even harder, we thought, when they get the Nets in the first round. Right. That didn't actually matter. But Going into the playoffs, we suddenly had the, the daunting possibility of having to beat the Nets and then the Bucks and then the Sixers or Heat and then the West team. And because of the early dip, even as hot as they were, they made their bed that way. You could even argue maybe that's why the Celtics aren't champions right now. Maybe they were the best team and would have beaten the Warriors if they hadn't spent the previous six weeks getting beaten down in their seven game drawn out series that they ended up in because they stunk in November and December. Like maybe everything came home to roost and that's actually all part of it. 